Kevin, we are live. What do you think about that? We're awesome, awesome. I love being live. <laughs> we, we are out there on the internet, <laughs> and uh, it is it's freezing where I am, by the way, in, in you know, the south. Yeah, I know. We had some snow, so um, actually it was actually it was kind of nice today compared to what it's been like. We've we've had some pretty bad weather, so a lot of snow on the ground. Uh, we're actually tomorrow, Thursday, we're expecting a possibly like a foot of snow. I think so. I, I will enjoy it now. A foot of snow? Yeah, we might be getting like a foot of snow. So we'll see. Uh, tennis indoors for me, so I'm I'm lucky in that aspect. You're you are lucky, and in, in the South here in Georgia, we think, <laughs> we think that you know it, since we live here in the South, we don't need indoor courts, and the weather's nice, and and it every time this year it is always brutally cold, snowing, raining. Uh, so yeah, I'm going through withdrawals on being on the court. So yeah, it's, no, it's crazy that you you haven't been on the court that much. No. Like it's funny, when it snows here in Tulsa, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, by the way, so when it snows here in Tulsa, um, I wind up teaching more tennis than, like, on a normal schedule. It's like, it snows here, kids are out of school, and I go on a teaching bonanza. <laughs> so That's good for you. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see there. Well, we, got, let's, we definitely have people out there. I just want to make sure that, that people can see us and hear us. So you come out there, let us know, give us a, a thumbs up out there, say hello, let us know where you are tuning in from. So we'd love to know. That'd be kind of cool. I'd actually love to know where people are tuning in from so yeah. we can we can know what's going on out there. Um, Got to invite close to Tulsa, which is always weird. <laughs> um, so, Kevin... I'm very excited for your topic tonight about learning how to accelerate on the forehand, huh? Yeah, no, I love I love anything that has to do with hitting a forehand. I don't know if anybody, well, you haven't seen me play yet, but uh, I like my forehand. I like hitting a lot of forehands. That's that's the bread and butter. So um, we're always apt to talking about how to hit a bigger and better forehand. Very cool. I'm looking at our thing on our page. It says, "Please stand by." So. I'm wondering why it is not showing us right now. Oh no, we are live. I okay, cool, there. cool. That, that's good. They, they always the the internet always wants to scare the Jesus out. Of <laughs> but I can I can actually see us right now. So that okay, cool. That is that is cool. Um, so very good. So Kevin, one thing. I was reading your bio, and it sounds to me like you must have had some pretty big goals out there. So I want to ask our audience if they have any big goals. If they're on, if they're on this webinar, I would imagine that they have pretty big goals in mind and want to do some cool things with tennis. So if, if you have some, some big goals in mind out there, I'd love to hear what they are. If it's to jump up a level, if you play USTA, and you want to get a better – rating, if that's a big goal, or if you have a tournament you want to win, or a certain person you want to beat, uh, let us know what that is. Uh, but and, and I... Uh-oh. Might have lost you for a second. A little frozen. Let's see if you come back. Oh. Can you hear me? Uh oh. Hey. You there? I only see a frozen screen, but it says I'm live. Do you want me to sign back in?
All right, I am, guys, it seems like we're having some technical trouble. Hopefully you guys can, can see me. Let me know if you guys can see me and hear me out there. But uh, okay, so cool. So Scott Levy said he is from lovely Boston. Sweet, yeah, I hear you guys right, loud and clear. Can, can, you, uh, can you hear me? Uh, also, guys, if you're out there and we go out, we will work on coming back. Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So I'm going to hang up the phone. Okay. Okay, we're good. All right, so so let me introduce Kevin. Uh, Kevin is, is, I'm a big fan of Kevin, by the way. I, I came across some of his YouTube videos, and, and I thought he was an excellent coach, and I could tell right away that he was somebody that A, was a good player, B, was a very good coach, and C, I could tell that a lot of the tips that he got and that he was giving is, is I could tell that he probably coached full-time and, and worked with students all the time because of just how clear he was and the kind of tips he gave. I kind of could recognize that he wasn't somebody just doing the online stuff, but he probably was in the trenches um, <laughs> And doing a lot of his coaching that way. And, and, and then I was reading his bio, and I saw that Kevin started playing at age 13, ended up playing Division I tennis, and also going out on the tour. Uh, so, Kevin, tell us how in the world did you start at 13 and end up playing college tennis at a high level and then having the nerve to go out on the tour? Because playing and starting at age 13... I mean that you know you're 13. You go to college at what 17, 18. Yeah, usually, you're, yes. <laughs> usually the first year of tennis is is a nightmare. You know you're just trying to make contact with the ball. How did how did you do it? Tell well, us. I think, tell us I think about it's how you one thing, kind of like a little side trail, kind of like how you started about having goals and you know I think when I first started and I really loved tennis, I had a vision. You know, and I had a vision. I I want to play professional tennis. I think every you know, young man or boy wants to play professional tennis. And I think in some sense, when you don't know you can't do something, you just keep grinding towards it. And I think kind of the, the story or the, I guess the main point is that I'd always just keep pushing and trying to play better people. And I think, you know, I, from starting really late, I was just really hungry. And I was really eager to try whatever it took, you know. And I was, I think, probably one of the biggest things that got me through kind of all the the – the, the the feats or whatever you would call it is that you know everything I took as a, a learning experience whatever I lost I won it was just learning and I was just so hungry you know and I think I relate to a lot of people online where you're, you're trying to figure it out and you're just so hungry and you, you're like what do I have to do and you know kind of you try everything and you, you try to figure out what works and so you know starting out playing at 13 kind of the, the really quick story we were talking about before is that you know my mom and my sister took me out to uh, to go pick up tennis balls because they didn't want to pick up tennis balls and so at the end I was like you know let me try and then I was pretty decent and we we had a friend that was a, a coach already and I started playing you know a little bit not a ton I, I just loved it I fell in love with it and you know I, I played with the juniors at that time but then you know I just got better than them I was hungrier than them and then I started playing with the adults. I showed up to my mom's drills and you know my sister's drills because they were mixed with guys and girls. And I just was hungry and I went through those drills. And then you know I I went to try to try out for my high school team and I was just hungry. And uh, you know kind of like the little pack I made with my doubles partners that you know we would go after every practice and go play an extra set and we would just battle. And then after that set we go run some more. And it was just you have a vision for something and you just keep going and you. You try not to let the, the defeats or whatever is in your way or not understanding something hold you back. And it, it took me a long way where, you know, I started off at a very small college um, in, like, Pulaski, Tennessee, of all places, and then graduated to, like, playing Division One tennis in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And even then, you know, I wasn't at the top, but it was like you see something, you just keep going, you keep trying to figure it out. And it just... You just, I think that one recipe, you know, and I think I can relate to a lot of people when you're, you're, you're trying to figure out the right information, you're trying to figure out what it takes and trying to find someone that's been there to take you there, you, you're willing to really work hard and do whatever it takes. That's, that's pretty cool. What I like about your story too is, yeah, you found out that you were, 
you know, you had a knack for it right away, but things didn't come easy to you. You, you, you didn't make the high school team right away because you played yeah. on a really good high school team, and, and so you didn't take that as, oh, I didn't make the team, so therefore, you know, this is not for me. You, you decide with your buddy, you guys are going to work hard together. Uh, you, you didn't end up at the college right away that you were going to ultimately end up at, but you were always, you know, striving to get to that next level. Yeah. Not being at the top didn't seem to bother you. No, I think I think sometimes when you you can see it, it makes you hungry. And I think uh, I was just hungry. And I think like you're saying, you know, for me, in some sense, I it might be a little bit personality. When people say I can't do something, it it almost irks me so much more. It's it it sets me on fire to do it. I'm always kind of set out to prove somebody wrong. So if, I mean, if someone's always like, well, you you can't do it. You're not going to make the team, you know, or you're not going to do this. It really focuses me to, you know, figure out a way to do it. Even if I don't have, let's say, the, the necessary talent or skill. I mean, for tennis, I'm um, pretty athletic, but that wasn't the defining thing that got me there. It was a lot of kind of just persistence, um, trial and error, a lot of it, and figuring out what works. Because I think, you know, you can look at some people and say, oh, they're super athletic. Well, in tennis, you can be super athletic, and it helps. But if you don't have the skills and the the knowledge of what you're doing, you know, it it doesn't really matter. And I think from my first probably couple of years playing junior tennis, that was it. I was athletic and could get around, but I had no clue of what I was trying to do on the court. I didn't know, you know, about strategy and just the experience of things. And I would I would just wind up losing a lot of matches, not knowing why. And you just figure it out. And luckily, I figured it out or figured a lot of it out over time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You end up playing some on the tour, and, and I've watched a lot of your videos, and you're a heck of a player, and you're, and you're, you're a good guy too. So I think, I think everybody out there, what I want you to get out of what Kevin just said is, you know, enjoy the journey more than the yeah. wins and the losses. You know, it, 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 play this sport not to just, you know, your ultimate goal is to get as close as you can to mastery for you, but... Don't be in a rush to get there. Enjoy the process of, of hitting brick walls and, and figuring out a way to finally get around it. That's really the rewarding part of it. I think everybody's, you know, sometimes you can just be in a hurry to get to a point that you think is going to make you so satisfied, but the most satisfying part when you, is when you realize you did all the work and all the steps that it took to get you to that next level, and then once you get there, there's another level to go yeah. to. So, yeah. so it's not like it ever ends. Um, Kevin, your forehand is really, really good, and so you wanted to talk tonight about acceleration. So I'm going to kind of hand over the, the keys of the uh, webinar to you because okay. the more I kind of talk and interrupt, I take over your screen. So I'm just going to come in and out, but uh, give us uh, your, your talk on forehand acceleration, which is super important to being able to go out there and play with confidence and, and what's ironic is you know sometimes the harder you swing the safer your shot will actually become and Kevin will explain that. Yeah well um, definitely today I want to talk about acceleration on the forehand and I want to kind of preference it before I get into the slides of why is it so important and kind of what's the different difference I think of when I say acceleration and what and what makes a huge difference for me especially when I kind of you get to the higher levels and you realize how much you have to accelerate and you have to be comfortable with it. And I think some people think when you say acceleration, it automatically means you're hitting the ball huge. And I think that's kind of not what I'm saying. Acceleration means being able to really move the racket. Now you have the option of hitting the ball big, or you have the option of creating spin, or you have the option you just have more options, and that's the key. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that. And you know, I could go on forever and talk about the forehand. I'd love to tonight, but I'm going to definitely keep it concise to where the things I'm talking about are kind of uh, basically science-based. I've tried to probably in the last um, six months to a year do a lot of really in-depth research on like biomechanics, and I've learned a lot from my experiences of you know training other kids and adults and my own experiences. But I wanted a, a kind of a concrete way of kind of defining it and setting out a fundamental way where you can get an easy way of understanding how can you increase the racket speed because it just when you know how to do that on the court it opens up so many opportunities for you so let's get started uh, I'm gonna share my screen really quick and let's see if it's sharing uh, Pete let me know to make sure I if, can see it the myth see it 
the, the myth. So here's the start of it. So basically, uh, we're going to talk about how to create more racket of speed and what to do with it. So the first kind of segment, I want to talk about what I think are some major keys to you increasing your racket of speed. And again, it just gives you more options. The more options you have on the court, I mean, it opens up more possibilities. And you know, as you progress, whatever level you are, more options equals kind of like more abilities to win more matches. I kind of put in a preference of when um, playing chess. When you're out of moves, you lose. You know, when you have no more kind of like options, you're done. And so you want to kind of create the most amount of options you can have. And I think racketed speed is something that gives you a lot more options. So I want to talk first about the myths, because I think there are some a couple myths. I'm just going to bring up two. And the first one I think is people think, well, I need to be strong to accelerate the racket. You know, and there is a part or a dimension of swinging the racket and creating racket speed that has to do with being uh, strong, but it's a very small part. The truth is accelerating, accelerating your racket has to do more with timing than strength. So I've seen and I've trained little kids that are like 9 and 10 that can hit the life out of the ball. And, you know, before in kind of my earlier years of teaching, you, I would think, well, you know, it's because they're not old enough. They don't, they don't have the developmental muscles to, to hit the ball that hard. Well, once you start figuring out the process of what it really takes to swing the ball, swing the racket and create racket at speed, it's not about how strong you are. It's about timing. And if you can figure out the timing, then, like again, the options open up for you. Myth number two that I've heard from uh, a couple of people that, you know, at a certain age are like, well, if I swing this way, you know, I might hurt myself. You know, if I change to a modern uh, swing, you know, you know, there's a lot of injuries on tour. You see that. You wonder, like, well, will I hurt myself? Well, the truth is, is not knowing, or sorry, let me say that again. The truth is, not knowing the right way to swing will cause you to hurt yourself. And I think that's one of the biggest things when people hear about racketed speed, they immediately assume that, you know what, I got I to gotta swing harder, I got to muscle, I got to uh, try harder. And it's actually so much the opposite of that because, you know, when we go through the presentation, you'll find out, oh, wow, it's about a lot of little things to add up to create that racketed speed. So let's talk about, like I talked about, what is racket speed and what are, how do I look at it? I think of racketed speed as your ability to swing your racket faster with control. Now, when you have racket speed, you have to understand there's got to be a, some sort of speed limit. You can't just go out there and swing the racket as humanly hard as possible because, you know, you're not going to be able to control it. True racketed speed, from my perspective, is swinging the racket as fast as you can with control because we need the control to do something with the ball. You know, I think sometimes we get in a habit of like, okay, I just want to hit the ball hard, which is great. But when it comes down to it, you know, that feels good. But what really feels good is winning matches and being successful out there and being able to keep the ball in. And to do that, you have to have some level of control. So I want to make sure we understand that there is a speed limit on creating racketed acceleration. And you have to understand that there has to be some gauge because I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm just going to go out and swing as hard as possible, and at some point the ball's going to go in. You know, how many people, um, when you go out there and you, you start learning how to really hit the ball, you think, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to hit the ball harder and harder. And what happens is, what happens? The, the ball keeps going out, and you think somehow it's going to go in. Well, at some point, you just got to tone it down, and you got to figure out what's the right speed for you. And that's going to always be the question you're going to ask, what's the right speed for you? I, I got I to interrupt you there because that's a great point. Uh, you know, and, and I know that you go through the same thing. When I'm teaching a lot of my lessons, I will see somebody hitting the ball. We finally get them in the zone where they start hitting maybe two or three perfect. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's it. And then all of a sudden they get out of the zone because they want to make the next shot even better. And what you have to understand as a tennis player, it's not always about hitting the next shot better and the next one has to top that one. It's when you get in the zone, when you find your optimum racketed speed and height over the net, that's when it's time to just stay there and try and repeat over and over again. Right, Kevin? Yeah, totally. And I think that is where a lot of people get into trouble when they start learning, let's say, the modern forehand or trying to learn a skill that we get in a, a rush and, you know, I'm the same way. Instant gratification. I learn something new and I just want to go out and like do it. But sometimes we need to take a step back and figure out, okay, you know what? I'm going to train this, this racketed speed thing. I'm going to find my speed limit and I'm going to stay there for a while until I can master it or I get to a point where it feels very comfortable. 
because the before I go, there's there's the the four learning stages, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but the first couple are just kind of breeze through them. Is that you know you want to make sure that when you learn something new, or sorry, when you're learning something new, you don't even know what you don't know. That's the first part. You just don't know, and then you start to figure out that you you need to learn something. That's the second phase, and the third phase is you know what you need to do, but you can't consciously do it, and that's where we are. We learn the racket at speed, but it takes so much focus, and what happens is we need to stay in that area where we're focusing on it so it becomes something that we know how to do, but we don't have to think about it. So, for instance, when I'm out there and I'm playing, I don't think about, okay, I'm going to swing the ball at this pace, or I'm going to do this with my racket, because I've done it so much, it's just unconscious, and I think that's the phase of learning that we all kind of dread is where you have to really sit down and hunker in and do something over and over and over until you get it. And once you get it, then it's time to progress. So racket speed, like I said, gives you options. It gives you options for more power, more angles, more uh, spin, more lobs. That's why you see the pros able to do what they're able to do, where the, the, the rallies are long, they're intensive, you know, you see these insane shots where you come up with the angles, you come up with the lobs, you know, they're, they're able to just do so much more, and I want to make sure that we give everybody that option that as you progress and develop more racket speed, you can do that. So the first thing I want to talk about is something that maybe you've heard, uh, I'm sure probably like Clay talk about, um, oh, we call the stretch shortening cycle. I like to call it the store and release. Uh, the same thing, but... Basically, what it is is, sorry, skip this guy, it's kind of thinking of your muscles as a rubber band. Your muscles are going to, like, if you have a rubber band and you stretch it, it creates energy. You feel the energy in the rubber band, and when you stretch it, that energy is stored in the rubber band. And when you let go of the rubber band, that energy contracts, and you see when it contracts, it moves faster. Now, your body's the exact same way. And this is the first concept you've got to understand that that kind of like store or when you, um, what I call like uh, one uh, example of it is when let's say I take my racket back in the unit turn and I use my, my, my core, you feel that, that tension in the core. That's where I'm storing the energy. That's the first part that you always want to understand that look for that store in the energy. The other part of when we're storing energy comes from when we push against the ground. That same action that we use our legs to push against the ground, we store energy, and then we can release it by pushing. Now, I don't want to make it too technical, but that's something you always want to keep in mind because if you can recognize that feeling of when you're storing energy, and I'm going to give you examples of this, you're going to uh, recognize how to use it later. So the whole reason of, uh, like I said, um, the importance of it is that by storing more energy, you can use it later. So the more you store energy, the more you can use it. Now, one trick about when you're storing energy, and I'm going to, like I said, going to give you examples of it, is you can't store it too long. So 50% uh, of your speed is lost with every brief pause. So this is why you see when the pros are swinging the rackets, you see the continuous motion. You don't see uh, pros taking their racket back, and then it's like when they start the swing process, or the swing phase, there's this like jerky motion. It's all very smooth and it all accelerates really fast. So what I mean by this is, uh, Pete, can you see my cursor just to double check? Yeah. So right here, this is a classic move where I'm using my shoulders and I'm rotating my shoulders past my hips. Now, this is uh, sometimes a tricky move because I think a lot of people when we're talking about the ready position and then we go into the, the first unit turn, what they do is they turn their entire body, which means my, your hips, your hips here, and your shoulders are facing direct, same direction, and you think, oh, I'm prepared. Well, yeah, you've got the racket back, but you haven't coiled your core. And the difference is here. If you notice, my hips are facing towards the camera, but my shoulders are facing back. And you can see it with these errors. And you can also see how, you know, Nadal, same thing. This is one of the first phases of uh, creating that stretch and shortening cycle, where we're going to create this stretch. Now, this is just one part of it. Again, you, you can also notice how Nadal has his legs. This is another part of it. And what you're going to notice is that over time, they're using lots of parts to create this racket at speed. So again here, the other part of uh, kind of using racket at speed is just having lag, where we're not being too stiff. A lot of times when people are trying to swing the racket really fast, they get really stiff. 
and anytime you're stiff, it's going to like choke off the power you can create. So make sure as we're storing and then we're going to release, we're smooth. You know, I had a couple. Um, I teach a, uh, an adult, and one of his biggest problems, he's got the technique, he's got the the swing, or the swing path, but he gets so tense, he loses. He almost chokes off the power in a swing. So you want to make sure that you're not choking off the power. How do you do this? You start learning to have full swings, meaning that you relax through the swing. You're pulling the racket around your body and not, not muscling around. So that's a big distinguish uh, uh, difference that you need to uh, understand. The other thing is the distance to develop racket at speed. Now, on the tour, you're going to notice different types of swings. You know, I have two examples here where you have uh, Djokovic. That's probably a medium-sized swing, and if you remember, you have uh, Fernando Gonzalez, who has a huge swing, but in, at the same time, he has a huge forehand, probably one of the biggest forehands on the tour because of the size of the swing. Now, what's the difference when you look at like a compact swing versus the big swing? Well, the big swing has all the power because you have the distance you're using to develop the racket at speed. The compact swing doesn't have the distance, but the, the advantages of it is that you're going to be able to play closer to the baseline. You know? And when we look at the big picture in the second half about you know, uh, playing points, you're going to notice that uh, based on like today's style, like Federer plays closer to the baseline than, let's say, Nadal did uh, a couple years ago. Now he's actually shortened his swing so he can play closer to the baseline. But those are some of the things you want to look at. How big's your swing and how you can use your swing to develop more racket speed versus... Oh, that didn't pop up. Sorry about that. Versus... We're not going to pop up on that. Pete, let me see if... Uh, tell me if the screen goes black on this. Okay. Did it go black? Yes. Okay, so it's not in play mode. Um, I'll bring this... Sorry about this. Can't do the presentation mode. But versus the big swing where we're talking about... I'll go back to the slide of... Uh, Fernando Gonzalez, where he has this huge swing, huge forehand, but you find him playing further behind the baseline, which he has to give up more court. So these are considerations you always have to make. Now, with the modern swing, um, you're going to have a couple different kind of takebacks. You're going to have that loop swing that you see all the pros using versus, let's say, the classical swing where it's straight back. Now, with the loop swing, we're going to develop more momentum. And the reason I have a roller coaster is because you notice on a roller coaster, the first part is what? You go up, and you have that like motion where it's click, 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 and at the top, the roller coaster goes over the top and you come down, and that builds the momentum versus a straight back swing where it, the racket goes back and it stops. You, don't, you stop the momentum and it goes forward. So I know this is really technical right now, but I'm going to break it down into something where everybody can like really take step-by-step -step action so we can figure out what we need to do to increase the racket speed. But I think understanding why you, uh, or how you can create racket speed is really important. So when I'm going to show you a video of Murray here and uh, show you how he's going to have this continuous swing motion, and this is really important, where I see a lot of recreational players kind of break down is that they have a very stuttered stroke. And every time you stop or uh, kind of add that different um, swing path to your stroke, it's going to slow the racket down. And hey, so, Kevin, we, yeah. Before you show that, is there a way you can make it just a little bigger so maybe people can see it? Is there any uh, way? Let's see. If not, it's okay. Let's see. Here, let me just, just go ahead and, since it's not going to be in presentation mode. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. But what I'm, I want you to, he's going to hit, I think, two forehands here. And what I want you to watch out for is how his stroke doesn't really stop. It has that moment, momentum he's building. And the other thing we've already talked about, you're going to see how he's going to use that stretch shortening cycle where he has that coil, and then he's going to release that coil very quickly. Okay, so I'm going to play it through. You can see on the first one how quick, both balls, very smooth. Now, I think this is one thing that a lot of player, recreational players struggle with, keeping the stroke smooth. The smoother you can keep the stroke, the more relaxed you're going to be, which allows you to really pull that racket through. So when we're talking about pulling the racket through, I think a lot of people think, okay, well, you know, I'm going to pull everything through at the same time. You know, I, and what you have to understand is the forehand has a lot of different parts. It's like a domino. You start with your legs, you move up, and you're hitting that next domino. It's like a, a, a link of chain. So 
kind of my analogy here is when you're you're breaking the link, you're pulling out the power. Uh, you know, so if you don't put everything together together in the right sequence, what's going to happen is you're going to lose or decrease the amount of power you have. So when we look at Federer here, uh, he's already hitting, but you can notice that the stroke's going to start with the legs first. And I'd run this through, but I, I, we can't get it on presentation mode. But it's going to start with the legs first and work its way up. So what that means is that the first move Federer's going to make after he's made that unit turn is going to, he's going to push against the ground. And that ground force he's going to use to turn his hips, to turn his shoulders, and then he's going to go down to the racket. Now the difference is most people, when they're trying to hit the ball really hard, they use one muscle. So usually it turns out to be their arm. They think, okay, I'm going to increase my racket at speed, so I'm going to swing really fast with my arm. And what happens is, like we talked about earlier, that's when you wind up injuring yourself. True racket at speed comes from using your entire body. Okay? Analogy or something to think about is like how would you, if you watch a baseball pitcher, you see them how they, they coil their legs, then they uncoil their legs, and then it turns to the hips, to the shoulders, to them throwing the ball. It's the exact same thing where you're hitting a tennis ball. So make sure you understand that it's the coordination of movements. It's making sure that you're putting all the movements together. Now, when we talk about muscle, muscle plays a small part. And when we're talking about racket speed, we're talking timing is more important than muscling the ball, which is when I talk to a lot of clients, muscling the ball is probably the number one thing that they struggle with. They think that if I grab the racket really tight and swing it around, then uh, we're going to, hold up, when if I grab the racket really tight and swing it around, then that's going to cause me to uh, get more racket at speed, and that's totally wrong. Actually, you're, you're suffocating. You're taking all the racket speed away from the ball. The other thing to think about when you think about muscle, if you really want to focus on muscle, it's about being, uh, have, using muscle for stability, meaning the, the stronger your abs are, the stronger you can keep your core, the, the more chance of you creating more racket at speed, because when you start swinging faster, you're going to have to use more of your core to keep your body stable. So focusing on flexibility and strength and power in the core is the way to go, and this way you're going to prevent injuries. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is kind of the famous heavy ball. Um, kind of to give a, a background story, um, I played in a challenger, where, if you don't know, the, the, the levels for the tours, like you got the ATP tour, which you see on TV, you have uh, some smaller level tournaments, you have the challengers, and you have a future. So I, one time I played in a, um, uh, a challenger, and I wind up warming up with uh, um, Luke Jensen. Sorry, Murphy Jensen. Murphy, I love Murphy. Murphy. Gotta love Murphy. But um, funny enough, so I was hitting with him, and I never forgot the feeling of when I was hitting with him, it felt like the ball weighed a ton. And I didn't get it. I was like, why does his ball feel so much heavier than mine? And then as I progressed and later on played different, you know, I played in Spain, the same effect. And I was like, it's just debilitating when you have somebody hitting a ball at, it's not coming harder, it just feels like it's a knuckleball. And when it hits your racket, it, it literally almost takes your racket out of your hand. And I never understood what that was then until now, looking back, and Basically, the heavy ball comes from generating spin and speed prior to impact. So a lot of times we're teaching, you know, I saw you do a great video on kind of extending through the ball, and that's the, 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 the speed component. That's the penetration. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's very important, first of all, if you want to hit a bigger forehand. Um, but to add the heavy ball means you have to add the spin as well as the speed. So a lot of times we have, like, the, the windshield wiper forehand. You know, and I've, I've done a video before talking about kind of like, I think, the incorrect way of using the windshield wiper forehand when people start using it and they get all this spin, but they don't get the speed. And they're trying to hit what they see, they hear on the, the TV, the, the heavy ball. Well, you have to combine the, the speed and the spin. And so if you notice, like, on these pictures with, like, Nadal, he's pulling the butt of the racket through to really apply the speed first. And on this picture, you see how Federer's racket's coming over. Well, they're applying both things at the same time. And most people, they do one or the other, but the key is making sure you apply both of them to get the heavy ball. So my formula for racket at speed is combining stretch shortening cycles and coordinated segments 
to the equals racketed speed. Now that sounds super, super um, technical, but I want to kind of give you um, some action items to do to make sure you understand what you're trying to do. First of all, we want to make sure that we always start and think about that power comes from the ground. That's our first shortening cycle that we're going to use. And so when power comes from the ground, you want to use your legs and load your legs and push off the ground to create more momentum so you can open your hips up. Uh, once you do this, you can then rotate. So let me find um, a picture. I'm going to go back to uh, Murray really quick. But you notice, and if you ever watch a lot of pros play, you notice how they're very grounded. And this is kind of like the first phase of understanding what you need to do to create more racket speed. You have to be grounded because the force of the ground is the start of it. Once you use that force, you can use that force to turn your hips and then your shoulders. And then that goes down to the racket, barring that you can be relaxed. So I'm up to taking any questions. Pete, if you got anything to add. Yeah, that, that was good stuff. Um, so as far as the whole thing with with thinking through this, you know, you're saying you got you go from the from the legs up to the up to the hips and then, then eventually it ends up at the racket. How do you start doing this to where you're you know, where it's all flowing as one, you know? Uh, how do you make well, that work? Well I think first of all I like the, when I'm teaching lessons, uh, I like to relate it to stuff you already know how to do. So I find it easier instead of kind of going cold turkey and saying, okay, you're going to, you, I relate it to certain things and usually sports. So my first thing is to think about um, bowling. <laughs> um, when you think about how you're going to bowl and uh, you, you kind of go down the lane, you feel how you're, you have the ball here and you start coiling, you feel that coil in your core. That's an analogy I use sometimes for, um, for hitting a, a forehand. Another one is thinking about um, uh, baseball, or in the sense of pitching, uh, how we have that same coiling action. First of all, I like to get people to understand that coil action. I think once you understand how you can coil, then you can start to uncoil. So an easy exercise to do is if you have a medicine ball. A medicine ball is probably one of the easiest ways to teach somebody how to coil and uncoil. So I would have someone go out with a medicine ball and just start from the basic, and you kind of see my chest here. I'm going to turn, and I'm going to release. And the more you can do that action, the more you're going to understand the uncoiling effect. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one question we have from, from Matthew, and he says he's teaching kids the forehand. How do you get them to progress to the modern forehand? Do you start them right away with the modern forehand, or do you... Th thank you, Matthew, for that question. Or, or do you uh, work their work their way into it? Um, that's a great question, uh, Matthew. First, I start with before I even go to the modern forehand. I talk about feel because I think most of the time you you start a kid out and you start them out teaching. Let's say the normal technique was take your racket back, and they take the racket back and then you give them a ball and they swing and they don't have a concept of feeling the ball and the string. So what happens is they hit the ball, the ball comes straight off the strings, and they don't have a concept of getting the racket to roll off the strings. So what I do, which is a very basic drill, is just have them tap the ball up and down, first of all. And then get them to understand, first of all, what I like to say is the racket face is going to dictate where the balls go. I usually tell a kid, like, the racket face has eyes. And whenever the eyes are looking, that's where the ball is going to go. So once they understand this concept, I have them start closing the racket down and just having them scoop the ball and then slowly I have them close it more and more and get them to feel the ball. The analogy I usually tell a kid for feel or you know, adult is I have them take their hand. I say, how much do you feel right now compared to if I take my hand and rub my entire face? And instantly when they start saying, you know, I, I feel so much more here, I say, I want you to take the racket face and I want you to rub the face of the ball. And once they, they make that connection and they have the feel, then I start working on the actual technique. And so when we look at technique, I like to usually start with um, just getting them to understand how to get the racket. And I pretend that the racket's just your hand. And I don't get super technical. I think a mistake in the beginning sometimes is getting so technical that we don't get any progression. So what happens is the kid or adult, you get kind of dejected because you think the sport's really hard to learn. So I just get them where usually I can get a kid or adult 
if they haven't played tennis, kids are sometimes easier because they don't have kind of already bad habits. So I can usually get a kid rallying with me, short court, and sometimes we use kind of orange balls or red balls, rallying 10, 15, 20 balls in about 20 minutes. I mean, it's very rare that I can't get a kid rallying 20 balls, 20 minutes, not focusing so much on the technique, but focusing on just feeling the ball. And I'll start them with a progression of have them hit and bunt the ball, and then I'll have them hit, bunt, and then I'll have them finish, and it'll be delayed, and I'll have them combine it slowly. Uh -huh. And once that happens and they make the connection of like, oh, wow, I can get the ball in play, then I start going back and working on technique. Mm -hmm. So like right now I have a couple of juniors that I'm working with. You know, they're around the age of 9 uh, to 11. I have two of them. They're pretty good. One's pretty, it will be pretty high nationally ranked. And that same progression. And then once you go through that progression of getting them, just understand getting the ball in play, then I start working on the unit turn. I start working on, even at a young age, the other thing I, I like to say, especially with kids that age, and Pete, let me know if I can ramble on forever, but I like to get them to understand that once they feel the ball, you can start teaching them modern technique. I don't think you have to go kind of like, okay, give me the T, and they hit the ball. You can start working those kids with modern technique if you break it down into small progressions. So it's kind of hard to explain on on because I don't have a full screen, but like that first progression where I go, I have them bunt the ball, then they bunt the ball, and they have the delay finished, and they combine it, and it turns into a top spin. Then what I'll usually have them do is I'll set the racket path, so meaning that I'll get them to start with their racket uh, back, and I get them to understand the swing. Now if they don't have, if they're having trouble with that, I'll start them with the racket, and you can't really see my screen. Let's see if we can work and make this work. I have them start with the racket right here, and then finish. And I work from usually the end to the, um, sorry, from the, yeah, from the end to the beginning. So I'll have them start with basically just a swing and finish. Then I'll have them take the racket back, and I know you can't see my arm here. Let's see what I can do. We'll get, we'll get creative on this call. I'll have them take the racket back and have them start here. Boom. And once they start here and they get to the rackets here, or usually I have the butt of the racket here, I just turn the wrist up. So... Pete, we're getting jiggy on this call. Yeah, yeah so you're doing it. We'll, we'll start with the rack here, and I just have them rotate the wrist up. So now we're in that take-back position. So they understand, okay, this is the position I need to be, and I roll my wrist under, and I pull the racket through, and then I come back to the ready position. And then they have the understanding what I think is the most important part is the contact. Because I think you start sometimes with the beginning, which is the unit turn, and they don't know how to, to, get, to make the connection. So usually what happens in the beginner, you start here, and they start swatting down. They don't have the feel. They don't have the, the coming under. So I hope that answers your question. I probably went on forever, but I'm super geeked about it. I can, I can talk about teaching for, like, hours nonstop. Very cool. Does anybody else, and I'll, I'll refresh the screen, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, okay, there was a, another one from Pablo. Uh, how much wrist is involved in accelerating the racket? Great question. Yeah, great question. Um, interesting. I call some, I when I when I'm teaching it, I do start them off with the using more of the forearm, and then I get them to relate using the forearm, and I start adding in more body parts. But to answer your question, I say you're rolling through contact. You know, I think when you look at the modern forehand, the modern forehand, the the racket is turning. Now, the key is making sure that if you're going to teach someone to turn it, you have to add all the other body parts. So there is where, Pablo, the, the racket's rolling through to the finish. We always see the windshield wiper finish. So just to answer your question, yes, there is some rotation. I don't think of it as where we're going to rotate all the way from, let's say, what's that, 180 degrees where it's just here. You're going to rotate it, and as you're rotating, it's going to come around at the end after you extend. So... Um, there is rotation, um, and it also depends on the type of shot you're going to hit. Um, I think just the, you know, we're talking about acceleration and uh, forehand. There is no one way of hitting the forehand, and I want everybody to understand that. You know, we can talk about the modern way of hitting a forehand, or at least I, don't, I think that way. But you can talk about the modern way of hitting a forehand. Well, you know, hitting a forehand is just getting the ball back over. I think we, we get so caught up in, the, like, how you do it, which is important, but, I mean, in the, in, if you break it down, hitting a forehand is getting the ball back over. Now, depending on what you want to do and how you do that, that becomes a modern forehand, you know, where we went from, like, a classical just drive through to now we're rolling over. Very cool. Now we have other questions. Okay. Jack wants to know, and I think this is a great question, 
Uh, how do you fix hitting the ball late? I've tried many things and I can't uh, get the ball in front. Is okay. there a magic exercise or drill? Magic exercise. One drill that I like to do, you might need a friend, um, is I'll have someone behind me toss the ball. So they're going to be behind me and they're going to toss the ball over my shoulder or on the side and I have to go out and get the ball. That automatically makes you reach for the ball because the ball is coming from behind you. So that's one way. Um, one other way that I find really works is just a simple cadence of ball bounce hit. It helps you get the timing. So when uh, your opponent is striking or a practice partner is striking the ball, in your head you're saying ball. And at that time, I'm also going back in my unit turn. So it's ball, and then my downward swing starts on the bounce, and then hit coming through. So, um, you know, I'd love to know a little bit more about kind of, kind of giving you general answers, but, you know, it could be your swing could be too big. There could be a, a couple things, but if you want a, a simple drill, I go ball, bounce, hit, have someone toss the ball uh, from behind me, um, the other thing is maybe just start also with the racket in front and just start from the contact to the finish. So those are three drills you could uh, probably do. And then, and then I'll add a little bit onto that too. One of the best lessons I ever got that I use all the time in tennis is I took an acting class as an elective in college. Oh, and Yeah, and... Uh, so anyway, the, the teacher, you know, everybody do their scenes and we all thought we were acting it out and, and you know, doing it big or whatever. You know, we, th we thought we were acting and, and, and the teacher would always say bigger. Do it, do it bigger than you think you need to do it. You know, whatever you think is ridiculous, do it as big as you can and then we can work it down from there. And lots of times when the student would then act bigger, the scene got a lot better. It, it got a lot more interesting. It became a lot more real, even though, you know, naturally you would think, well, this is going to be fake because I'm, I'm totally acting now. I'm overacting. But lots of times what people thought would be overacting was actually perfect. And then you, you would just be watching the scene going, holy cow, this is awesome. Like, I'm totally into this. And so if you're late all the time, your body has gotten used to a certain position that you deem is correct. And so one of the things that I think you could do is just try and rally and, and hit the ball out even outside of the doubles alley early. And lots of times when I tell my students to do that, you know, they end up hitting the ball perfect because their perception of what they think is on time, they're just going to keep repeating because they keep going, okay, this is the right time to swing. Don't be afraid to miss the ball into the other court and then work it back until you're finally hitting the ball on time. So there, there's a tip from, from me. There you go. Yeah. Any other questions? Because um, I got the other half, but I'm all about answering questions because um, freestyles we, were worth that. We, we do have a couple more. Let me, uh, there, there is one person who wants to know about, let me, I'm just refreshing the page here. Uh, I know there was one about the legs. How do you get the ball? Do, do, do. I want to make sure I find this one specific one. Where was it? Well, I know somebody wanted to know about, about the legs and the open stance and the closed stance. What, what do you think about that? Um, I think most of the time the, they're both great stances before I say this, but I think most people overuse the open stance. I think the open stance is for balls when they're very fast and you don't have time. Uh, the neutral stance or stepping forward or, you know, people call it different things, closed stance. Um, I look at it as the neutral stance is when you're stepping in the direction you're going to hit. I know some people say, well, or sorry, the, the closed stance, they step across. I don't think you're going to step across because you're going to lock out your hips. And anytime you start locking out your hips, you're going to stop power, you're going to stop acceleration. So what I mean by getting jiggy with it again, by locking out my hips, is basically when, if I'm hitting a forehand and my body's this way, if I turn, and you can't really, you can kind of see my hips now, but if I turn and I'm trying to hit it this way, my hips are locked. Compared to if I'm at this angle, I can rotate through. So I know everybody got on the, the webinar to see my hips, but um, I think, um, and it's been proven um, scientifically that, you know, you get more power from the um, 
the closed or neutral stance when you're stepping in. Now, it really depends on the type of shot. I don't think you're going to only hit one type of stance. It really depends on the situation that your opponents put you in and the situation you're in. You know, if you're on the run and you can get there in a time, step into the court. The other big thing I think when you talk about stances is you really want to think and consider about time, which is kind of a little bit talking about strategy. I think of tennis as a game of time. You know, at any level, if you can learn to take away time, that's the number one strategy there is. So what stance is going to take away more time? It's going to be the uh, neutral stance where you're stepping into the court. Anytime you take a step away from your opponent, you, that's a step they always have to make up for. So kind of like to give you a little rundown, I always think of when I'm talking about a strategy to a student, I think the first base level is just making balls, being consistent. Um, the second uh, level is attacking their weakness. Okay? The third level is uh, attacking movement, and the last level is attacking time. And when I talk about strategy, I figure out how I can either use uh, all those at the, in one point or use one or two of those. So like an example would be, kind of a progression example would be, like if we're starting off a point, I would just try to keep four hands in. And if that doesn't work, I would use my forehand to attack your backhand if that's your weakness. If that doesn't work, I'm taking each step higher, I'd attack your movement. So I might take my forehand to your uh, forehand first to open up the court, then use it to run you to the backhand side. And the last progression of taking away time would take do that same forehand to backhand combination with my forehand, but follow the forehand to your backhand in and volley the next ball so you don't have enough time. So kind of like giving you a little rundown on strategy, I'm looking at what footwork I'm going to use based on how I'm going to play the point, you know, and what I'm trying to do, and also what my opponent's trying to do. That was very, that was awesome stuff. And, and I think another thing that you're talking about there is, I, I totally agree with you, because there's some coaches who will say, you need to step in every ball, you know, you, st you still need to step in. Then there's other coaches like, well, it's, that's out, you know, it's the modern forehand. But I think you've got to think of your footwork like dance moves, and you've got to have more than one move because the game is so dynamic. You can't just step into everything. You can't just hit open stance on everything. It, no. and, and, so, and, and definitely the pros, when they have time, they're going to step into that ball like you see people stepping into the ball in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. It's the same. They, you know, yeah. They're stepping in and crushing the ball. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, Hey guys, have a que this is Jeff. I have a hey question Jeff. with loading of the leg. Should I okay. be loading with my back leg and pushing off? Question mark. Okay. Well, first of all, kind of like when we we're talking about the stances, I need to know what stance you're talking about. You are gonna load with the back leg. Um, you know, because you're gonna if I'm stepping in, I guess you would step you load with the back leg on either one. Um, but you can load your legs while stepping into the shot for a, a neutral stance, and you can load for a um, open stance. You know, um, one thing I think, you know, when you're talking about loading your legs, there's different degrees of loading your legs. So, like, if you watch like the pros, if they have time, you're going to see a deeper load, more explosion. But you notice sometimes if they don't have time and the ball is coming really fast, you don't see a huge load. So, you know, like. We were watching the, the video of Murray. You didn't see a huge load there. You didn't see this big down up of him loading the legs. There's not really a need to. Um, there's kind of a step and a transfer of the weight. So it's also, you know, what type of shot you're hitting. So um, I wouldn't say you, you have the opportunity to load on every ball. You know, if uh, the ball's coming really quick, you're just not going to have the time to load. But if you can load, you're going to use more ground force, which is going to allow you to increase your racket at speed and have more power. Very cool. All right, we got another question. How do you judge? This is from Michael Strutton, by the way, who is an inspirational man who I uh, I coach here in Douglasville, and there you go. so I'm glad he's on the call. And and he says, how do you judge your racket at speed? How can you tell that you're at your maximum? Okay, I would say you judge your racket at speed by, and again, you judge what I would say is you judge your racket at speed speed limit. So. If you go out with a ball machine or a friend, test it out in this sense. If I go out, I hit, let's say, what I would consider uh, five balls at 60%. Well, I should make uh, most of those, pretty much all of those at 60%. As I increase in my racketed speed, I'm going to start missing some balls. Now, you have a couple options you're going to do. You're going to either add more spin to compensate for the amount of um, uh, or uh, speed you're hitting into the ball. So 
I guess when you say how do you judge it, you're going to judge it based on, or I would say you judge it based on how many balls you can hit in at the maximum level you can swing. So at some point, you're going to start missing. And that's where you're going to start going, well, this could be my speed limit. And, you, you know, you're going to have to judge what's comfortable for you. You know, I know that in certain situations, I can swing very fast and make 9 out of 10 balls. But in the process of doing that, I'm not penetrating the ball as much. I know if I start really penetrating the ball really hard and trying to really um, accelerate, that my percentages of balls going in can go down. And I know that. So that's my speed limit. And that's how I judge how much racket acceleration I'm going to use, is based on how many balls do I need to get in. Because in the end of the day, you know, we're talking about racket speed and it gives you more option, but you've got to make the ball. So if you're accelerating, you have all this acceleration, and you're not making the ball, you're, you're missing the main point. The acceleration is to help you do things like make more balls, you know, you can, but at a higher rate, the, to create more uh, angles, lobs, more options. But it's not just to uh, use in itself. It's using acceleration for a purpose. Uh, that's, that's very good stuff. And, and to add on to that, too, I would say, you know, you want to be able to, you become a much better player when you're able to work your stroke up like you're on a volume dial. Like if you're listening to the, to the stereo and you, you're on, you know, level one and then you go all the way up to level 10. And to be able to go up level by level, not a lot of rec players can feel that. But if you ask Federer to demonstrate a stroke and, and hit it in the modern style and, and hit it like he's got to hit it to a four-year-old, he can do that. And then within five minutes, he can blast it, you know, over, you know, 90 to 100 miles an hour if you ask him to. And he can look pretty much the same to where people, when they start hitting harder and harder, their form breaks down. And when your form starts breaking down, you're hitting too hard. You want to, you want to figure out how can I have the same style of technique as when I'm hitting super soft and then how hot, how fast can I go up to and still look the same? Uh, that's when you're hitting under control for me. We, we have another uh, question on, do you prefer the straight arm forehand or the double bend? Oh, the magical straight arm double bend question. Um, I personally have a bend, um, and that's just the way I've learned. Uh, I've tried the straight arm. The time is a little bit different. Um, you know, you see, like, Roger Federer has a straight arm, Nadal has a straight arm, um, uh, uh, Djokovic has a little bit of a bend. Um, kind of reading, I've been, like I said, I've been doing a lot of research. Can, can you maybe show people what you're talking about, what the, what the difference oh, is? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, let's see, uh, I don't know if I have a picture of the contact. Well, I'll just show. Um, basically, it means when you're hitting, when you're hitting your forehand, you see like a Roger Federer in the arms completely extended at contact where you have like the double bend, you have like a Djokovic who has a little bit of a bend, you know, and you see kind of like the gambit, um, I think like if you look back a little bit older, you saw Andre Agassi with like a little bit of a bend uh, versus some other players. Mm -hmm. um, from, which is ironic, looking at some of the books, they say, let's say a double bend provides a little bit more power. Um, but you see a lot of the top players using the straight arm. Um, the reason they say the double bend adds a little bit more power is because of inertia, meaning that the farther your arm is away from you, the more force it's going to take to move it, compared to if it's closer to you, you can actually move it faster. Now, it's, it's a, that's a tough one, because, I mean, you, you see the top two players in the world, well, I mean, Djokovic is the number one player now, but, I mean, you see a lot of the top players using the straight arm, uh, more so than the double bend, I guess, at the top right now. So what's, what's your opinion on that? Well, I'm going to get up and see. Uh, am I coming on the screen? Can you see me? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to get up here. I, I, I still see you. I don't know why it's not. It doesn't seem like it's going over to me. Really? Oh, well, may, maybe it is. Well, Hopefully you guys can see me out there. But I think, first of all, there's definitely players who hit more straight and then more of them bent. But the game, the game, again, is dynamic. So it's not like they do that all the time. And I think a lot of that has to do with the height that you hit it at. So if I'm hitting here at waist level, you know, this looks natural. 
You see, if I'm if I got the double bend going, that looks pretty natural. Now, if I go up here and hit it, now I look silly, and this this becomes more natural. So also, if you're going to be bent or if you're going to be straight, depends on the height. And just to make it simple, just so we don't get carried away, you know, the lower it is, you can have more of a bend. As you go up higher, your arm is going to get straighter to have it feel more natural. Uh, so there you go. Hopefully people could see that because I saw you the whole time. It didn't go to me, but um, uh, I'm gonna have to do the, the like, I'm gonna have to like, show them what you were doing. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, all right, let me refresh the screen. See if we have any more questions. This this is pretty fun little um, Q and A. This is an active group, my friend. I love Q and A. I can like I can do Q and A. Q and A is where it's at. All right, uh, I can I can't. Only see Kevin. I can't see Peter. What? What's that? Uh oh. That hurts. <laughs> I gave a great demonstration. That I'm sad about that. Uh, hopefully, you guys could hear what I was saying. It, it seems like it's only on you, Kevin. What did you, did you manipulate this to where we can only see you? Yeah, by accident. I'm I'm sad. I, I think it's only you that people can see. Wow. Do I need to press anything? Ke Kevin has taken over this webinar, guys. <laughs> anyway, I think people heard what I was saying. Basically, the higher the ball is, your arm would straighten out more. And the lower it is, you can get away with being a little more bent. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's get... You prefer straight arm double... All right. Here, here's one more question. What are your top uh, three favorite forehand drills for advanced players? Oh, wow. I love questions like this. Um, I guess I'm going to kind of preference it for you. Um, depends on what you're working on. So one of my favorite drills is a racket at speed drill is where you have a coach in front of you and they're tossing balls in the air. You're working on taking the ball out of the air. That's probably uh, one of my favorite drills. Um, Another drill, hmm, the drill I used to do in Spain uh, is, again, develop racket at speed, is you start off on the service line. Um, well, I'll leave the screen up. But you start off on the service line, and you have a coach feeding you balls. And they're feeding you balls that bounce in front of you, but it bounces below the net. And you're supposed to take full... Uh, cuts, full swings from the service line, and you're probably like on the service line to maybe a foot behind it, and you're supposed to go cross court down the line and angle, full cuts. Uh, normally a lot of times when you do this with a player, because they're so close inside the court, they slow their racket at speed down, and what the drill is, the purpose is to really make you accelerate the racket. Um, and my third favorite forehand drill... Um, I really love hitting inside-out forehands. So one of my favorite drills is just having someone set up cones on the other side and really work on getting around the forehand and loading the legs and crushing inside-out forehands. Um, trying to think if there's any other, like, teaching drill. I'm trying to figure out, I mean, if you're talking about acceleration, I think those are good drills. Um, I would say that's it. Very cool. And I think one thing that you mentioned that uh, I, I really wish people would really uh, more accept, e even with the juniors, uh, but also the adults, is they look, at, they look at the orange ball and they think this is a kid's ball. And I think it is a great tool that you can always use, and especially if you're trying to figure out how to feel yeah. the spin on the ball and make that ball roll, you can really, first of all, the ball is slowing down for you more. And I just think you can feel that ball more. And you can certainly see, because of the two-tone color, you can certainly see if you're getting action on that ball or not. And so I encourage, I'm sure we have mostly all adults here on the call, I encourage everyone out there to use low compression balls as part of your training. And I don't ever want you to think that you grow out of it. It's not like you only hit with you know, orange and yellow balls, or you only hit with, you know, the uh, the regular balls, you want to mix it up, and you can always use them. Totally. I kind of want to tag on that. 
Um, I use that a lot, especially with, um, and I know we're talking about mostly adults, but I've used it with adults, I've used it with kids because it helps people or kids, adults, work on acceleration. So um, a lot of times if you have like a court painted with the 60 foot court lines, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but it, um, I don't know if we're international, but I'm sure you, it's a 60 foot court which is inside the normal baseline. It's a great tool also to use if you're thinking about how to focus on not how to miss. But if I use a red ball, I'll go out with an adult or kid and we absolutely crush the ball. And you work on so much racket acceleration because now you have you have a little bit more feedback, like Pete saying, it, it, because the ball's going to stay in. You can really work on working the ball. You can see that ball rotate more versus it goes straight through the, the air. The other part of using, let's say, a red ball, especially a red ball, is that it's not going to go out. So it gives you the ability to have this rally go back and forth and really develop racketed speed. That's actually a great drill. I'm, I'm really happy you mentioned that. But, I mean, that's a great drill to just really work the ball over and over. So. Yeah, and I think you also it can also be used as a live playbook. Uh, I remember one time I was doing it, I was trying to do a video, and I was tr we, uh, the guy I was playing with was pretty good, but I, I was at a different level than he was. Uh, but he was a good player to hit with. But, but because of our different levels, we couldn't really get the drill to work to where, you know, we're like, let's hit one down the line, then here, and then there to show the play. And, and we were going at it for probably like 20 minutes with a regular ball, and I was sweating like crazy. I'm like, you know what? Let's use a low compression ball. And then we were able to run the play right away and make it look good. So it's a great way to also break down the court and do more advanced things because now the court is smaller, the ball is slower, and so you can kind of really work and feel what, what running certain things would look like, and it's a lot easier to control very advanced ideas and, and concepts and yeah. be able to do it right away with somebody at your level or maybe even a lower level than you or a little higher level, but it's a, it's a great equalizer. And speaking of what, what Kevin was talking about, I have some 10-year-old kids to where I'm telling you, I can go out there and play as hard as I want yeah. And because it's a low compression ball, they can get the balls back. And so it's kind of cool that they can kind of see what an advanced game looks like, but they can handle it to where if I was trying to do the same thing with a regular ball, there'd be no way they could hang in there with the stuff that I'm putting on the ball. But once they see that and then they start to actually go to a regular ball, because I think that's a bigger fear is, you know, what happens when I use a regular ball? They're able to adapt and get themselves in position better than my high school kids. It's pretty amazing because a lot of our high school kids, you know, they started later and and uh, you know they're not as serious as their younger kids because I just kind of started a program from scratch. All right, a couple more questions. Um, this is Michael again. I'm going to give you two questions here back to back. Okay. Okay. We've got Pablo and Michael. I'll ask Michael first and then Pablo and then you answer both of them. Uh, I'm an interme intermediate player and interested in improving my forehand acceleration. What consideration should I give to string types and tension? That's question number one. String types and tension for creating more spin. Uh, Pablo, any drills using ball machine? Okay. String types and tension. Um, I don't really have a preference. I, growing up, I used to string my racks really tight. And so that made me swing the racket a little uh, faster compared to rackets that are strung a little bit looser where the ball might fly off the ball, the strings as much. As far as strings, um, you know, I know you have like the strings that have the extra filament going around and it gets a little bit more grit on the ball. I don't really know, to be honest, if it adds that much more spin. I think you would get much, much more benefit focusing on how you can use your body uh, to really get the extra acceleration. And the second question was... Any good drills for ball machine? with the, Oh, with the... good drills for ball machine. Um, you could set up a ball machine and do that exact same drill where I was talking about earlier where you're on the service line uh, and you're just having the ball actually land really short, really soft. I think another thing when people are trying to work on a racket at acceleration they get a ball machine or get the partner and they want to work with somebody hitting the ball already really hard. So what they do is they use the force of the ball and they add spin and they're like, oh, I'm hitting the ball hard. I think the trick is really learning how to hit the ball hard or hitting the ball with more acceleration when there's no, nothing on the ball. 
So I would actually recommend using, uh, if you're going to use a ball machine, don't have it hit the ball that hard and work on the acceleration so you truly know that you're generating all the spin and the pace that's on the ball and it's not that you're using the pace from the ball machine. So that would be one where you have the ball machine set up super soft, have it kind of barely bounce over the net and you're going cross court, down the line, angle over and over again. Another uh, great racketed uh, drill you could use with the ball machine is have it set up where it's shooting it higher and you're probably on the surface line again or maybe a little bit uh, halfway between the surface line and baseline and take the ball out of the air so it's like a swinging volley. A swinging volley is a, a great drill to develop more racketed speed. Very cool. Well, I think we... Uh, all right, we got one more question then we're going to wrap it up. Um, I think it's Casio. I don't know if I'm saying this right. Uh, hey, Kevin and Peter, what is more important to hit hard, a clean and full contact or the speed of the swing? Clean and full contact. Um, I think it's, it's both. I think in the sense that if you don't have the speed, the contact isn't going to really matter because you're not going to have the force behind the ball. And if you don't have the good contact, you're not going to be able to place the ball where you want. And you're not going to have depending on what type of contact are we talking about. Are we talking about just driving through the ball or we're talking about more of a kind of like the windshield wiper, heavy topspin forehand where the wrist is going to be rolling through. So I think both is important where you're talking about controlling the speed you're using at contact so that the rack of face is uh, under control and you can direct the ball. So Very good. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you and everybody. I mean, it's kind of cool that we've got this community that, that comes out at night we're, you know, getting late here, 10, 10 15 for me, well, almost 10, 15, and, and, and pretty much everybody has stayed online. I've noticed that the numbers have grown almost as we've, as we've been here. Awesome. And so I, I want to thank everybody, and definitely that you guys participated tonight and asked lots of questions. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun for me and Kevin to do this, and we, we appreciate it. And Kevin, I know that you actually have something... Uh, so people don't go away empty-handed. Yeah, well, well, I was definitely not say, going empty-handed, but you, you have something even cool for them to, to give them tonight, right? So for how, how much time do we have? Are we are we crunching or are we... Well, well uh, I, could, you, I could go quick. How I had much time more, do you need? Well, give me like like five... Give me like two minutes. How about two minutes and then you you give us... And send me the link too because... Oh, when we lost yeah, I'll it, send I, you the link. So yeah. kind of the last thing I want to talk about um, let's see if I can bring up the screen. It was uh, basically my favorite play. Is I'm going to cut it kind of short because I know we're running for time. But I want to talk about um, like some strategy ideas for the forehand. And I think one of the biggest things when we talk about what I call the priorities of the forehand and kind of like you want to have it in the sequence between having height, depth, placement, spin, and power. And the reason why this is important is if you think about when you're playing a point, uh, usually your opponent's going to attack you because you're not doing one of these things. You don't have enough height where the ball's landing short or it's not deep enough. Your placement's poor. Uh, the spin on the ball doesn't really affect them or the power. So think about those things and also think about how you can use those. Those are not only just things you want to use, but you can, you can use those in a way to think about how can I break down my opponent? You know, what shot or what priority are they struggling with? Um, I'm going to skip that really quick. But the other real thing I really wanted to talk about was, was pattern recognition. I think this is huge at any level. And when I think about pattern recognition, it's your ability to identify certain sequences of shots that happen repeatedly uh, during a point. And what I mean by this is that a lot of times um, you have something that's going on in a point, and we just get so caught up, we lost the point, and we don't say, you know, what happened? And the moment you can start realizing what happened, you're going to realize that tennis is, is the same patterns happening over and over and over again. And the moment you kind of step out of yourself for a second and go, you know, what's really happening? You're going to become a better player because you can start handling different situations. And I, I think of three basic patterns, which are positive patterns, which are uh, patterns that put you in control of the point. Like we've been talking about forehand, acceleration, you know, how can you use your forehand to put you in control of the point. Negative patterns are patterns that consistently make you lose control of the points. What, when you lose a point, what's happening? Because I think a lot of people, when they lose points, they just, you know, they storm off mad and they're not really into what just happened. And once you start really picking up this, you start asking different questions. And the last one is neutral points where what 
are the patterns where you don't lose or gain anything. So kind of like what I was alluding to, start asking yourself questions like, what put me, what put me in this position? You know, so if you start winning points, ask yourself, how did I do it? Did I hit it to a certain area? Did I, um, did I, did, did, you know, did I hit it short? Because a lot of times we, we just automatically assume hit every ball deep. I've seen matches won because the person actually hit the ball short and the opponent never wanted to come to net. But they didn't realize that until set later after hitting every ball super deep, doing a great job, and not realizing that the person was absolutely excellent in playing defense. Uh, the other question is, um, what can I do to avoid what, you know, what's being, uh, avoid being put in this position? So if you're losing points, start asking yourself questions. I think that's the biggest thing that, you know, a lot of times we forget to do. We get so caught up in the moment that we're not asking ourselves questions. So I'm going to go through one of my favorite little patterns. And then I'm going to, uh, Pete, I'll send you that link so we can send everybody to uh, some training because I know I got really technical and uh, I'd love to give you some really practical stuff and actually show you on court how to do these things we're talking about. So I don't That's want it to be great. just theory. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite plays that I think um, kind of based on, uh, this is me, this is tennis ball, I hope everybody can see it, is kind of like what I call the bait. And what I mean is, I usually start off the point, usually a, a forehand cross court, and I'm looking for the short ball to pull my opponent off the court. You know, I'm going to hit an angle here. Once I hit that angle, this is kind of the bait. If the person hits it down the line, it gives me the opportunity, and I'll switch this around. It gives me an opportunity to move here and hit a backhand cross court. Okay? And what this does, it completely makes them have to run now. They went from being off the court running and now that I'm set up in this position, here's the trap. So this represents my racket. I'm sitting over here, if I hit a great cross court, and I'm sitting here waiting for a forehand. And you notice I didn't recover here, I recovered here. I'm waiting for them to come back anywhere here. I'm daring them that if they're going to win the point, they have to go down the line, and that's fine, because if they do, I'm going to run over here, hit a forehand, and make them run again. I'm in control of the point. But more than likely, they're going to try to play defense here. Now I got my forehand against their backhand, and I can work that as much as possible until I get a ball that's in the middle of the court, which allows me to run them again, or they go down the line and I run them again to my forehand. You can see how I'm just putting myself in this position to go inside out, inside out, inside out, and so I either break the backhand down, which is totally fine, or they hit me a short ball in the middle, and I can run them or go behind them. So you're always looking for that forehand where I'm going forehand deep, forehand cross, bait them to go down line. If they go back cross court short, then I can change the directions to go down line and attack. That's one of my favorite plays because it gives you the ability to really, really control the point with your forehand, and it makes your opponent run. If, is, if you've noticed, I've ran here for the f first shot, but I'm pretty much controlling the point, and if they make a wrong move, I'm going to run them more and more. So keep that in mind. Um, and cool. this is the link where basically I want to give you guys some free training um, where we actually, I'm going to actually show you what we're talking about with uh, loading the legs. Another uh, thing called uh, using the opposite arm to generate more racketed speed. Uh, basically all you have to do is go to this link, opt in, and you're going to get uh, some free training videos from my brand new program, Forehand Domination, that I haven't even released yet. I haven't even released the, these videos because um, I'm going to do a big update on my uh, forehand course, so I wanted to make sure you guys got these videos before anyone else. Wow, that's um, cool. No one's even seen these videos. I just have my editor. He just finished them yesterday. So I want to send these videos out to everybody who's on the call as a big thank you for having me. And also, just to give you some practical stuff that you can do to um, and see how to do it. It's a little harder to show you exactly how to do it. Um, and here... Pete, I'm sending you the link now, but I'll leave okay. this on screen. But it's very simple, um, www.forehanddomination.com. Um, uh, I think this is what, a forward slash? Peter Webinar. Uh, so make sure you go there, opt in. Um, and page looks cool, too. I love the page. Cool, good. I, I'm glad. Uh, make sure you go in there, opt in, and you're going to get the first... Um, once you opt in, you'll instantly get the first video which is a simple video, check that out. And uh, in another day or two, I'll send you another video, and another day or two after that, I'll send you another video. And uh, I'll probably, in those emails, I'm going to answer or uh, give you some other good tips. So I want to make sure definitely we over 
or at least I over deliver here because you guys were so cool about asking me all the cool questions because I love questions. <laughs> Very cool. And guys, if you're if you're on still on the page and watching it, all you have to do is scroll down to the comments. Uh, look, I, I've only made one comment on this call, uh, so look for Peter Freeman. I'm in the orange uh, jacket there with a the tennis ball, and I have the link, so you can just click on the link to go there. And let me just refresh the page, see if we have any more parting shots, any questions, and then we're going to uh Here, let me stop sharing nine. the screen. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I'm just refreshing the screen to see if we have any, any more thoughts from from our crowd, which was really cool. Uh, I don't think so. What was that noise? What noise? No, oh, that was some weird noise. Maybe like a dog barking. Well, I could tell your dog is missing you. It seems like it's trying to, <laughs> trying to yeah. get in there. Hank, uh, Hank running around. I think that's good. I think we had a great night, and seems like there's no more questions, and uh, I think it's a good time to tell everybody to maybe you know, just check out Kevin's free course, and uh, maybe you can sink your teeth into a video or two before you go to sleep, and uh, we'll see you guys next week for uh, Newcomb. Is, is next week March 2nd? Um, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, our next one, we're going to have John Newcomb on the call March 2nd. How <laughs> crazy is that? That is crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, so John Newcomb Newt. next week. Uh all right, everybody. I'll be saying that Newcomb link out, you know, in a couple of days. I'm actually talking to him tomorrow, so we're going to go over uh, lots of stuff. We're going to go over on the call, so it's going to be exciting. All right, Kevin. Hey, Peter. I appreciate it. Everyone on the call, I appreciate it. Uh, you, you guys putting up with me, but uh, this is awesome. I'd love to do it again, and definitely uh, check me out. Check out that those free videos I'm sending you because uh, I, I definitely want you guys to improve your forehand. All right, I'm stopping it in three, two, one.